Hello, welcome back to theCUBE here in the Palo Alto studio. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. This is the Silicon Valley AI Infrastructure Leaders Executive Series with theCUBE, partnering with NYSE's Wired Community. We have Krishna Ragasahi, who is the founder and CEO of a hot startup. I love this company, SEMA.ai. They're doing cool stuff with machine learning. We love the edge, it's exploding very fast as the hybrid and AI kicks in. You're going to see a lot of stuff around computer vision, embedding technology at the edge. It's got data all kinds of great multimodal capabilities. Krishna, great to see you. Thanks for coming back on theCUBE for this uh, Silicon Valley AI Leader series. Thanks for the invite, John. Pleasure to be here. You've been on theCUBE, Dave Vellante, and I watched your video, it's phenomenal. Love the success of the company. Semiconductors Thanks. are hot. I mean, although Intel uh, is trying to get back on the game, <laughs> we, you know, it's a whole nother conversation, but, the, but there's, a, there's a platform shift. It's well documented. I mean, we see Nvidia at every trade show and conference they got some great tailwind, but it really highlights the underlying trend that deploying AI in all aspects of, of the stack, right? And it's, it's now becoming such a profound shift. The, the products are shifting. So you get a market shift and a product shift. You guys are deploying machine learning system on chip. You got integration of various applications. You guys are in the field. Computer vision's hot. It's one of the key multimodal growth areas. Uh, and obviously we've seen IOT, we've been covering that for a long time on SiliconANGLE and theCUBE. So really in a hot spot, you, you have a unique perspective and being a founder too, <laughs> you probably got some scar tissue to share as well. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's, you go back a decade, you know, hard to get funding for a semiconductor company. Now it's like all the rage, all the VCs jump on the bandwagon, but it's a really, it's a big market. It's, it's changing fast, but it's just the beginning. I mean, how do you see it? Sure. No, I, I think you kicked it off really well. I mean, I think AI is here to really reshape all of compute and companies that jump on the bandwagon have derived the benefit of it. Companies that haven't are, I think, still challenged in getting on the mainstream on AI. But I think my observation is, I think over the last 12, 15 years, we have seen AI scale really well in the cloud and really well in the consumer persona. But the markets that have been left behind are the physical industrialized world robotics, automotive, medical, um, embedded edge applications broadly. And so we decided to build a purpose-built platform. We started SEMA AI about five and a half years ago, and we were well on our way. We we're engaged with 50 plus customers globally, and we we're pretty excited to scale AI capabilities and bring new things that either were not possible before or really at a, economically are a very different element of productivity and efficiency than ever before. You know, Krishna, what's interesting is we all saw what happened with the CrowdStrike, you know, metadata update on the config files impacting the Microsoft machines. That kind of had a trickle effect to the real world. And, and it did impact physical, industrial edge, like normal things we deal with every day. Airplanes, right. hospitals, um, right. you know, just things in general that we like, it was kind of a Y2K kind of doomsday, but it happened way later, right? 24 years later, <laughs> things went yeah. down and you saw the results. Right, and this is, I think, a tell sign of what's coming on. And you guys have solutions in this area to, to make that much more smoother. So before we get into it, take a minute to explain what SEMA AI is doing, um, sure. what your mission was when you started, the vision, where you guys are now, uh, and what you guys are doing. Yeah, awesome. And, and we're uh, getting close to 200 people at SEMA AI. We're five and a half years old and we're well-funded. Uh, we have raised $270 million so far. Um, and and I think it'd be fair to say that in the area that we are focused on, we everybody's definition of the edge is different. We'll get into it, I'm sure. We call it the embedded edge market. Uh, we are definitely leading the pack by a significant margin. And I think the observation that I told you about is that I think cloud and consumer AI is built out. And we saw the opportunity, particularly around COVID, that nobody COVID really exposed us to all the complexity in the physical world, supply chain issues, productivity. If you think through it, architectures haven't changed in 40, 50 years. Yeah. There's a massive need for an AI adoption, but the core issue that we struggled when we saw the, uh, saw the industry was, everybody wants AI at the embedded edge market, but nobody has really built a purposeful platform. Right? We've been hearing about autonomous cars for a long time, robotics for a long time, and all these need AI enablement, but we saw an opportunity where people are not really scaling. And so we wanted to build a company to scale AI to the physical edge. So that's the core purpose, the core rationale for what we do at SEMA. 
no doubt things like CrowdStrike exacerbate the need for a while. We really have a long ways to go in technology. People are still using Windows 95, Windows 3.1. Just change is slow in this market. So we really need to find a way to make people feel comfortable to embrace change and jump into the deep end on AI. And that's at the core of what we want to do at Seam. It's not like I want to jump on the, the bandwagon to pound CrowdStrike or even worse, Microsoft and that because they're machines, but it really goes to show you the adoption shift has been lagging. You know, industrial IoT has been on the radar for a long time, manufacturing, critical infrastructure, uh, but all these other industries kind of slow moving because there was no real catalyst to move. Correct. And I think the intelligent application market that's right. looming around the corner is about to explode in a Cambrian way. It's just going to be pretty insane because of the unique benefits. And I think what I like about what you guys are doing is cloud has been scaling. We're kind of on next gen cloud. We saw the results, even Amazon's results recently, uh, although people were kind of hit on them. AWS was still strong. I mean, it's been continuing to thunder away. And then you got now distributed computing paradigm on the hybrid data center side maturing. And now the edge is looking at um, as look, it's going to be growing significantly. But what's interesting is there are real use cases sure. now where that you have visibility into, you know, reliable, smart, yeah. intelligent ways to one streamline. I think what Generative AI does is it, it it also changes the application, which is the edge of people to the device or whatever. But the new use cases that are weren't available sure. before are, are I, popping their head up. Can you share your thoughts on one that? that viability and the visibility yeah. into, the, into the execution side, but also the use cases that weren't possible sure. with the data. Exactly. Can you share? Yeah, and, and I'll, you, you covered good ground there. And so I'll maybe answer your question in two parts. One is the cloud's always going to be significant, but the edge has really been kind of left behind. We are over abusing, throwing everything at the cloud today. There are three reasons why the edge is going to be the next big gold rush for AI. Number one, I think locality of compute. So certain applications and robotics or automotive is the poster child for it. You're sensing data, you want to be computing the data instantaneously. You don't have the latency to send things back to the cloud. So that's one locality is going to drive a shift in edge compute. Number two is really around safety and security, right? So throw in all the things that we talked about People are not paying a lot of attention to safety and security as it comes to AI, and it's going to take more and more of an importance going forward. The third thing is TCO. The cloud's pretty expensive, and then cloud's not very affordable for a lot of these applications, and people want to monetize their own data and make profit out of their own data. And so these dynamics are going to really shift to where there's a better balance between what stays at the edge, what becomes the cloud, right? So that's one paradigm shift that's going to happen in the next few years. Second, Play this out four or five years. I believe every appliance on the edge, anything you touch today are going to be multimodal. So they're going to have computer vision. They're going to have audio capability. They're going to have textual capability. They're going to have tactile capability. So the human ability to interact, the human ability to really make the user experience easier yeah. is absolutely going to be there in everything we do. You could argue how quick is that experience going to happen and certain markets may move faster than the other, but we're already seeing an enormous shift where it's no longer what we call unimodal to really multimodal and everything is going to be multimodal and generative AI is going to have a footprint at the edge and we're beginning to see early use cases across all the market segments, robotics, people are talking about humanoid robots. We are talking about really automotive vehicles where the experience and the interaction of the car is going to be drastically different going forward. But we see this across everything. And we see this across every single device we touch is going to have an intelligence embedded and it's going to be multimodal. Yeah, and the intelligence application is going to drive that because that's the catalyst because you can actually quantify the value. And I like this evolution timeline you can walk through, you know, unimodal to multimodal. It reminds me of how everyone compared the generative AI movement, you know, two years ago to the web, it's a revolution. But if you think about the web, right? If you think about the web, and I, and I want to get your reaction to this because I think this is kind of notable. One, I've said on theCUBE with Dave, with Dave many times that the acceleration and timeline was going to shrink significantly. It's going to be faster than the web because it was of less of adoption. People were online population was growing. But if you remember the first web page, it was text, right? Yeah. And then you had graphics and then you had video. Then you had multi multimedia in in the page. Again, that went years through because the bandwidth got better and, and just just technology got better. 
almost the same things happening here. You're starting to see the unimodal text, LLMs, yep. computer vision, you know, uh, uh, disable fusion, these things are going on. And so now it's happening faster, but so to make things multimodal or integrated, they got to move from the silos. So the models, right. um, however you look at it, text, vision, and, and PDFs, I mean, they're all different modals, have to be integrated. So as the infrastructure gets born one, first, what's your reaction to that? And, and as if the infrastructure gets better, what happens? Because now you got to integrate them. So, okay, in a silo, yeah. they get developed, here's some graphics and vision, here's some text, but now I've got to put them together. Yeah, I, uh, great point. And I think it's a great analogy to what you just illustrated, what's happening with AI. And I think in my mind, the industry has missed three things. One is unlike the cloud, the edge is very, very power limited, right? So you could throw a lot of compute, thousands of watts, maybe megawatts really around data centers in the cloud. Edge, you're limited by five watts, 10 watts, 15 watts. So you need amazingly high performance, but at really, really low power, right? So that's been a large limitation for scaling at the edge. That's one problem. The second one is we have 40,000 customers at the edge. So it's not seven hyperscalers. So how do you scale software? How do you scale self-managed customers that could innovate on their own? And tie it all together, you need a platform that to your point goes from unimodal support to a multimodal, but make it really, really integrated in a power efficient way and in an ease of use where people can very quickly deploy and they don't need thousands of AI ML engineers to really build a product, right? So that's been the gap and we are, one of the pioneers in this area in building this out, but I'm quite convinced that while it'll take time and we've seen early adopters jump on the bandwagon today, unlike what happened, like what happened the cloud in 2010, 2012, you have onesie, twosie folks that jump in, then it becomes tens and hundreds, and then it's the whole world. Yeah. Same thing's going to happen at the edge, right? But I think what we're enabling is really a purpose-built platform. It's power efficient, focus on ease of use, and really brings this democratization of AI yeah. to everybody at the edge. It's a great point, Christian. You know, I was, we had some folks on earlier in the program that were targeting four customers, the hyperscalers, Meta, et cetera, we own who they are. There's four customers, there's 70% of the business. Okay, so that's one approach. You have to ha enable Correct. hundreds of thousands of use cases or more, you know, we don't know, probably a lot, billions of people have devices. Sure. In locations, you can, the math is probably off the charts. You probably have the number handy. Um, <laughs> so, so form factor and energy yep. and power drive a lot of the behavior. So you guys have a unique software approach that I think right. speaks to that. Can you share why that's important? And two, data is also a factor because sure. once the infrastructure gets better, the data is going to have to reset too. Then that script will right. flip. Okay. And then, and then third, you know, as you look at the software, all the success right now in some of the big uh, apps that we see high performance is they get as close to the kernel as possible. Okay. Right. And so you're starting to see a developer computer science category where it seems like there's been a, like a sleep mode for two decades of really <laughs> kernel developers, meaning yeah. low level, close to the silicon. Right. You're in the middle of this. Could you share your thoughts on those, those, th those dynamics? You know, oh, I, what, I, right, the software approach, this kernel developer. Absolutely. And so uh, to us, though we're a silicon company, we position ourselves as a software company building our own silicon. Right? AI is all about a software experience. And so while there's a renaissance of silicon, reality is if you look at who's the market leader and what makes AI scalable, it's software. Mm -hmm. It ain't just silicon alone, right? The combination is what matters, but if you don't have a world-class software solution for scaling in particular, it's really going to hurt. Yeah. And to your point on kernel and kernel optimization, um, I'll make two points. One is that community allows us to really take generic or open source software and optimize them in such a way that you deliver the world-class performance that you need, right? So people want the world-class performance, but they want it abstracted at an ease of use. These are where the kernel optimizations really, I think, go kick in. The other point I'd really um, want to emphasize and make is software strength is going to differ. So you want to pick a good silicon company, their strength of the software is going to decide how good they're going to be, right? So software is almost the most essential thing here. And no doubts, I think in my mind, if you look at some of the market leaders that have made it, 
the software pulls them through. The folks that have struggled through it, they have a silicon story, but still searching for a software. Hey, all you developers out there, calling all kernel developers, a lot of opportunities. This is where the innovation is going to be. And if you look at NVIDIA, they're a chip company. I still say they're a chip company because they charge by the chip, but their software is big. Everyone knows sees NVIDIA and other companies are looking at building out ecosystems. So I want to ask you the question as, as the founder, I'm sure you're thinking about this. You have to create an ISV ecosystem sure. of developers because again, just because you're making silicon, you're a software company first, but at the end of the day, the advances and the use cases could be driven by who could take advantage of that. So I'd imagine you're thinking about an ecosystem and, and what does that look like? It might not be your grandfather's ecosystem or our, you know, the old ways, you know, I build a, you know, I mean, I mean, the joke on the cube was full stack developers went to half stack developers with the cloud. Now you have full stack systems developers. So, so take, give me your thoughts on that because this is a really oh, nuanced I, I, point. I mean, you're obviously a great student of our marketplace. So uh, partners are at the very, very core of multiplicative success. Yeah. So we are a chip company that is also a software company. We cannot be in the domain of applications as well. Right? We, we need to be good at where we are. What makes the journey easier for our customers is the ISVs that you just talked about. So we are engaged with top three ISVs for every vertical we are going after, whether it's robotics or smart retail or industrial or oil and gas or medical, what they do is bridge the gap between the customer need to our platform, right? And, and they could do it across multiplicative number of customers. And so we have a mutually exclusive partnership opportunity where we both bring a lot of value to our customers. And so beyond being a chip company, I joke, we're actually an ecosystem partner company. And what we do is create a platform. And given the strength we have in our performance per watt, our power efficient capability, and the ease of use, we are seeing a lot of amazing partners sign up with us. And our journey is really going to be around equal part, building our platform and strengthening it, but also building out a great ecosystem partnership where we bring value and value add to our customers, but also to our ecosystem partners. Awesome, so you are, it's, you are doing it. And that's, that's right in line with what we're seeing. I want to ask you, okay, if you believe that to be true, which you, I agree with you, I think that's the fact, and everyone's validating that, that you can have an ecosystem even though you're a silicon player. That's not your traditional you know, semi ecosystem. It's a different right. approach, the developers. Okay, so developers will grow in that area because that's where the value is. They're going to go where the value is. The next thing that's going to happen is you're going to have opportunities to do two things. One, have, sales go through say channels. So yep. that's going to be go to market expansion, but it's got to be easy, right? You can't have a product that's hard, right? So you got to have the ecosystem, which you'll develop and we'll be tracking that, but then you got to make it easier because what's going to happen is it's hard and you want to make it easier just to turn something on, connect it, especially as people start getting into say computer vision. Yep. We, all, we all see the ring doorbell. We all see that and we see cameras on, on poles at intersections. But as you start thinking about the diversity of devices, yeah. It can't be a truck roll and rocket scientists de deploying these devices. You got to have that and you got to have the data. So you got to have an architecture for distributed computing, easy to use and install, and you got to people who, to do it. Yeah, after, no, I, and, and if you're ever bored of your day job and you want a real job at a company, anytime look me up, John. <laughs> <laughs> sure, yeah. I, so I, I think you hit great points and I would end up giving you more data to validate fundamentally your observation. Ease of use is key. I'm going to one day touch 40,000 customers. And if I have to truck crawl and provide very, very capable people behind it, we don't have a scaling capacity to really go look to, right? So one thing we have actually done is AI yeah, and ML is not easy to do, but computer vision is harder in that it's not only AI and ML, but a lot of pre-processing, post-processing image analytics, data, right? Like we covered the ground. And what we have done is we have rolled out a package, software package called Edgematic, where people have a no code ML environment. They don't need to know anything about AI and ML or computer vision for that matter to really work with us. They drag and drop capabilities. We provide 200 plus ML models. We provide a lot of pre and post processing libraries. So like your Lego robo kit, you could connect the dots and you could build out your application in the cloud. You click a button and it works on our chip. So this is really the necessary thing for us to scale. Ecosystem partners need it, our customers need it. And the analogy I draw is when we had Nokia and Blackberry phones, they were very popular, 
but you had to press seven or nine different buttons to get anything really done. And here comes along Apple, all you have is a power button and you just move on, right? And so look at the scaling the smartphones have done with Apple coming on board. It's the same analogy I draw to AI and the edges. We really, really need to make it easy to use and easy to deploy so that high school students could do very critical application development. If you can build the millennial Falcon with Legos, you can build apps <laughs> at the edge. That's what you're saying. <laughs> I, I, I like the tagline, that's awesome. All right, that's so let's, awesome. let's, get into, let's get into the cool use cases. What are the, what's the coolest thing that you've seen? Obviously, there's a lot of cool stuff going on with computers that were use cases that were never there before. What, give us some, a taste um, of use cases you've seen that you go, wow, I never would have thought of that, or that is really cool. That's the coolest thing I've ever seen. So we are enabling medical applications where we are helping save lives in ways that you could never do with classic compute. You're able to image better, you're able to predict better. You're able to also really in factory floor automation, bring a level of productivity and capability that they could not. Some of our customers process more than a million units a day. And for them to really do visual inspection with human beings, is just a very poor story. AI is really capable of hanging with it and you get the very best of efforts to go look to. Automotive, we really think that we'll be reshaping level two plus. The world's today using 600, 800 watts to run level two compute, we'll be at 50 watts, right? So we really are touching very many facets. The other area we're very keen is partnering with the US government to fortify our AI infrastructure so that we could defend the nation better. So we're touching very many different aspects and what I see is AI is just going to be the norm in everything yeah. going forward. And the new capabilities that AI could bring is things we didn't even comprehend, yeah. right? So if five years ago, somebody had said, you could be multimodal in every appliance you talk to, people would have laughed, yeah. but it's here, right? And so I think the future is really, really bright. I still would say we're in the very first innings, maybe the first pitch of AI. And <laughs> spring a lot training. really. <laughs> it's like spring training. We are in the spring the training. Of AI. Uh, no, it's, it's <laughs> true. season hasn't started yet. It, 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 people <laughs> organizing. And this is my next question. And, and I know we don't have a lot of time left, but I want to get to it because you're seeing use cases and you're deploying. So I have to ask sure. you a lot of people are looking at this because you know we're seeing in our, with our research team, and of course the CUBE interviews we do, is that we're cl it's clear the infrastructure is advancing very rapidly, um, like what you guys are doing. When, as that progresses faster, the, the next layer that's going to be disrupted is the data layer and data warehouse, even data in the cloud, as you mentioned, cloud's not the only end game. You need to have a data architecture that doesn't yeah. look like data science analytics for BI pipelines. Yeah, dashboards aren't going to go away. You're starting to see the rise of the data engineer. So what is your view on what's the best practice for setting up a data platform to have a robust edge so you can take advantage of your innovation? What's the things that you see that are working? Absolutely, and so, so where we see the early adopters go is they have a great data management, data collection infrastructure, right? And so we are seeing 50 customers that we engage with today have world-class infrastructure. Each one is kind of ratifying and building their own. I think there's a massive industry opportunity to help the edge customers manage the data differently. The cloud world obviously has figured it out, but even if the seven hyperscalers do it differently, they have enough scale, enough footprint to go look to. But not only is it AI management, and I keep joking that AI and AI ML models is only 10% of the problem. Data management, edge ops, ML ops, integration, improving the models, getting feedback from the data and improving the data set so you get better, more accurate relationships with your overall infrastructure is really at the very core of where things are. I think I would say we're also at a nascent point at the edge. That is the other maturity the industry really has. Another great opportunity for companies to step in and innovate. That's awesome. Chris, you're great. You're a great guest sharing a lot of nuggets here. The data that's coming out of this interview is phenomenal. We'll certainly put it into our Cube AI. <laughs> and the joke of the day was that we're going to get a Cube chip uh, you know, someday. So why not? Everyone's doing it. Um, great story. Let's talk about you as an individual, as a founder, it's always hard. I always tell folks, I've founded six companies. Um, it's hard, right? I mean, it's really hard to do a startup and then grow it and be successful. It seems like it's a roller coaster. Every day is the, seems like it's just a start of another, you know, journey, leg of the journey. How has your journey been as the founder, looking back and where you were and where you are now and where you're going, 
What's your mindset? How do you feel? And what are the, the key takeaways that you have? No, I, I, great question. And I occasionally reflect on it, though I don't get a whole lot of time to reflect on it. <laughs> um, I've been in public companies all my life. This is my very first startup. But I would summarize my five and a half years as the most gut-wrenching five and a half years, but also the most gratifying five and a half years. Both are simultaneously true. And it's just real. I mean, there's no hypothetical, there's no safety net. And every day, as you said, is a roller coaster. And every five minutes, you could have a severe high and a severe low. And it's all compressed and it's moving at a fast pace. But I really enjoy it because I think the ability to make the impact, we're building something which is better than anybody else's in the industry. And instrumenting this at a bigger company is pretty hard. And you get to work with some amazing, talented people that you normally would not see in very large companies. And so the combination of the people element and the ability to innovate and fail fast and recover is really amazing. But at a human level, I almost would submit to you that I'm a better human being today <laughs> and that I'm more humble. I'm more respectful of everything around me. And resiliency is at very key at surviving in a startup. Yeah, you're going to take a lot of hits yeah. and you're going to get a lot of successes. But to really believe in your North Pole and keep pushing every day, in spite of every hurdle, is I think it's a very key of success for the long term. You know, you you got to fall down to learn how to ski or whatever you're doing is golf, but the good shots and the good turns make it matter. Exactly. You, you put them in the bank, public and the private victories, keep it going. Chris, you guys got a great opportunity and it's great to have you on the queue as part of this program. And again, we'll, we'll keep in touch. You know, you're great Absolutely. to our community. And, <laughs> great, and, uh, great interview, enjoyed it. Yeah. And I appreciate you inviting me again to this. Have a good day, John. Thank you. Welcome, this is theCUBE. Welcome to our studio here. This is where we're doing all the infrastructure leaders, the impact of this big wave. It's not only an impact of the world, but it's a wealth creation opportunity as well. I mean, these businesses are coming out of nowhere. They're creating value. That's part of this new infrastructure AI leaders. I'm John Furrier, theCUBE here in Palo Alto. Thanks for watching.